Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. And now to your host, Ken Jakes. Hi, everybody. This is Ken Jakes. I'm the host of Democracy That Delivers, our weekly podcast here at Site. And I'm joined by uh, with uh, Connor Leach. He's a program assistant for Europe here at Site. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, Ken. So what countries do you work in? Uh, we work in 17 countries right now, actually. So we work in Central Europe and the Balkans. In the Balkans. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Yes, We're Serbia. going to talk about Serbia. <laughs> yes. And we're joined directly from uh, Belgrade. He just got here last night. So hopefully he stays awake for the 30 minutes. He was telling me about the jet lag that he has. It's early morning here in Washington. So, and the, his name is uh, Rasko uh, Pitakovic. How you doing? Hi, Ken. I'm I'm fine except for the jet lag. But I'm like like I told you, I, I'm pretty pumped because this is my prime time of the day. Exactly, so. it's like two o'clock in the afternoon right. or something <laughs> right. like that. Yeah. So we were talking before the podcast. I used to live in Serbia mm. back in the early 2000s. So I remember I used to have a hard time going east, and uh, so I would it would literally take me three or four days to get used to the the, the time when I went, travel over there. But coming home, I have no problem at all. It's usually one or two days, and I'm back to normal. So I don't know about you, Connor. I don't I'm, know. I'm the same way. Same yeah. way. Yeah. It's always worse going I think east. it's those overnight flights that get yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because we leave here at 5, 30, 6 o'clock at night, and then you get in there super early the next morning, and you're just dead. So so let's get right to it. Uh, Rasko, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, how you got to your current position. We were talking before the show about, because I was over there in the early 2000s, and things have changed dramatically since then. Yeah. So let's kind of look at the evolution, uh, especially in the economic uh, realm of, of Belgrade and, and, and greater Serbia, and just kind of walk us through a little bit before we get started so we can kind of give the listeners a really good idea on what's going on on the ground there. Well, the, the easiest way to look at it is uh, in 2000, in October 2000, when uh, Serbia overthrew the Milosevic regime, that was the break with communism. Because up until then, everything after the Second World War was communist, either soft or hard, but ultimately communism. In the 90s, it was mixed with nationalism, but then that, that just make it worse, if it's, uh, if it's possible to make communism worse. Then in, in 2001, we got the new prime minister, we got the new government, and then the economic reform started. With the economic reforms, we had the privatization process, the stabilization process, and we started uh, uh, economic and other reforms in order to join the European Union and at the time hopefully NATO. However, as you know, in 2003 our Prime Minister Gingic was assassinated, which kind of put put some breaks on the reforms and and I worked with him directly when I was over there yeah. so he was a great guy he's a very smart guy we were talking before yeah. the show v- very very smart guy I think uh, a, a guy you see once in a generation yes. especially for a, for a country as small as Serbia right. I think he was uh, you know a great thinker uh, outside of the box he was unlike your ordinary politicians he was able to solve problems Unfortunately, all of that was uh, ended with uh, with the sniper shot, and right. uh, luckily, the the persons responsible are now in jail. Right. But unfortunately, I think a lot of the reforms either halted or or were uh, slowed down. Slowed after down the, exactly after the assassination. Luckily, some of the spirit that that uh, came with the uh, with the change still persevered and and I would say even persevered with this current government in Serbia because everybody in Serbia now realizes that the reforms are necessary they might disagree as to what direction they might take but everybody understands that we need to change something and we need to to move uh, towards the European Union towards uh, integrating into global economic uh, playing, you know, field. So that's that's what's happening right now. Slowly, sometimes slow, sometimes fast. We are affected by uh, things like global economic crisis. Right. But so so well, we is can even go else. back to the financial crisis uh, yeah. in in uh, two thousand. Um, yeah, it was uh, two thousand seven. Yeah. Uh, how did that affect? Well, um, and that probably slowed things down even more. Probably. Yeah. Uh, in two thousand in two thousand eight. We had two two hits in parallel. One was uh, the 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 government that decided to up uh, public spending, mm-hmm. and the financial crisis. So these two crises hit Combined. at the same time. Yeah. yeah. And the pension fund essentially lost about two billion euros right. at at the time, and then uh, there was a slowdown because of the economic crisis. Public debt go, go, uh-huh. has gone up, and and so. 
uh, even even when other European countries and other uh, uh, world economies started seeing stagnation and even some progress, I think Serbia has uh, had to wait for at least two or three more years to start seeing the, the development. So the last year was the first year after the, the global crisis that had a significant uh, a growth in GDP. So that was interesting. And then and this, what was driving that? What was driving the, uh, the, the boost in GDP? Well, uh, the thing is, there, there were movements, there were foreign direct investments coming right. into Serbia, but at the same time, there was a need to contract the economy in the public sector. So mm -hmm. the, the pensions had to be reduced, public spending had to be reduced, the uh, uh, wages in the public sector had to be reduced. So that was driving the, the, the um, uh, spending down. Yeah. And ultimately, that was slowly... Uh, contributing to a slow growth in the in the economy. Right. And now uh, these things are finally being netted. So last year we see we, we've seen the growth. This year is projected at between three and four percent. Oh, okay. So this not bad. This, yeah. This this feels good. Now, yeah. in, in what sectors are you seeing it? Uh, manufacturing, mm -hmm. uh, digital. You know, um, uh, it, it's it's it might might be interesting for for the American listeners to know that that we've. Last year, I think in the last quarter, had two major transactions from two uh, U.S. companies into Serbian uh, digital sector, into Serbian startups. Mm -hmm. So these were uh, uh, high-value transactions. I cannot disclaim. Uh, I cannot disclose the, the 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 value. But for example, Epic Games, mm -hmm. uh, who you know as creator of Fortnite and, right, and these right. uh, other games, has bought into a Serbian company. Um, so. The digital uh, startups are a uh, really big hit in Serbia right now, and manufacturing, uh, which is particularly driven by foreign direct investment. So the companies like Continental, companies like you know German car makers, let's right. put it that way, Chinese raw, uh, right. uh, raw manufacturers, and so on. Well, the Germans have always been very interested in, in Serbia, yeah. uh, so that continues. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I, I think uh, out of uh, and and this can go into uh, public misconceptions about the, about the big drivers in the in the economy. Uh, while people think that Russia and China are, the I really big, want to get into yeah, that. Yeah. While, while people have the perception that you know, I think two thirds of the people believe that China and Russia are the biggest investors they're in not, Serbia. Not close. They're <laughs> yeah. They're, <laughs> I think uh, uh, maybe maybe not. Both of them are in top yeah. 10. Yeah. So uh, European Union drives most of the growth. European Union drives most of the foreign di direct right. investments. Then, And I the, know that because I worked on privatization issues when I was yeah, there. Yeah. And, and I saw it with the French, the Germans. They yeah. were heavily involved. Yeah. Is, and now, in the recent years, the U.S. companies are getting involved. So, yeah. uh, I think it was announced maybe a year, uh, maybe a month ago, that KKR, the, the yeah. large investment fund, has exited from uh, Serbian investment that was uh, that 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 is by far the largest ever transaction in the Balkans region. Wow. So that you know they they haven't disclosed the value, obviously, but it was above three billion euros, probably. Excellent. Yeah. So when we talk about some of the pitfalls uh, in the Serbian economy, there's so many different variables that go into that. You mentioned one, you had you have outside influence, especially from Russia. But there's other things, too, that are distinct problems in developing and emerging democracies, uh, one being corruption. And it's always been a problem. How has that been addressed, uh, say, since 2004 when I left? Because I know, I know it was a big problem then. Mm -hmm. They wanted to talk about it, but there really wasn't being a whole lot done about it. So, and, and kind of walk the, the listener through the evolution of that since then. Well, I think the best way to describe this evolution would, would uh, be – just to explain, just to tell you the names of the agencies uh, empowered in fighting corruption. So the first, we had the Council Against Corruption, then we had the Board Against Corruption, then we had Commission Against Corruption, now we have Agency uh, Against Corruption. So um, it's, it's like form an agency in order to, you know, kind of mitigate, you know, avoid the problem. Right. So, uh, unfortunately, not not much has been done because okay. with every new government, we, we are restarting the process. Uh, with every new government, we are 
uh, reevaluating uh, um, kind of balance sheets of the the officials. We're looking at how much money they they had before they came uh, to office and 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 how much they have after they they did that. So unfortunately, a lot of it is uh, an ad hoc thing. So not much is being done consistently. And the biggest problem for this is not maybe the political will, because the political will might exist. Uh, it might be one consistent thing, but the rule of law is 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 highly flawed. And, and rather than fighting corruption, I think one of the key problems for the Serbian economy and Serbian society as a whole is to to develop further its its rule of law to have independent justice system right. to have independent legal system and to have that kind of help the the agencies and the the public uh, but also the political consensus drive that forward right and how has parliament changed uh in in the last 20 years there mm. uh i we were talking before the program uh in the early 2000s, it was still Serbia was still part of Yugoslavia, mm-hmm. which made it a very complicated political uh, setup there. And then uh, Yugoslavia dissolved, and we were talking probably 2004, I think it was 2006. Yeah. Two, oh, two, I'm sorry, 2006. Uh, but the but the Serbs have always played the most predominant role, even in the in the in the former Yugoslavia. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was there, you, we had a president. A prime minister, of course, and prime minister really held most of the power, uh, and the parliament kind of followed. Uh, has that really changed since then, or or is parliament more of a, of a have, have a stronger role? Um, maybe in two thousand two and two thousand three, there was uh, an increase in the significance of the parliament. Of the parliament, right? But from that point on, it just started declining. And uh, uh, I think it has it is close to hitting the rock bottom because right okay. now, right now we don't have public debate on key issues in the parliament. We don't have uh, debates over very important issues. Uh, the opposition uh, parties do not have sufficient number of representatives in order to meet the quotas for being able to address the parliament for on on, on certain issues. Uh, materials for the for the sessions are being delivered. You know, uh, uh, a minute to twelve. Yeah. So there are a lot of things which it's which al- almost like that here, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> almost, yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of things that people can do and and think of, kind of very creative things that allow them to have the parliament functioning, uh, but making it a very uh, a, a formal and not uh, not a very meaningful and useful thing. Let's talk about outside influences, mm-hmm. in particular the Russians. Mm-hmm. And uh, you mentioned something that we've been working on here. We have, and I want Connor to get involved in this because he's heavily involved in, mm-hmm. in this project here, but on corrosive capital. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where Russians and Chinese, and in particular in Serbia, the Russians come in, make investments, uh, but they've also bought up a lot of media outlets and media organizations. And which has really had an impact on public opinion there. And you just talked about that. And if you do a public opinion poll in Serbia, you'll find, like you mentioned, two-thirds of the people think that the investments from Russia and China completely outweigh the rest of Western Europe, United States. Uh, and it's, it's not factual at all. Mm-hmm. So they've done a really good job in instilling that, that public opinion. And that coupled with the fact that the Serbs have always been very aligned with the Russians culturally you know, going back for centuries. Um, so how does all of that kind of play into what's going on in Serbia now? Well, I, I think we should start by saying that Serbia is very fertile ground for foreign influence when it comes from Russia or China. Right. Because uh, because of the fact that it was a communist country for such a long time, it is uh, uh, pretty much open to influence yeah. from countries that, that have preserved... The Slavic country, yeah. Orthodox country... Yeah. Yep. And and then autocratic and countries. Autocratic, yeah. exactly. Uh, you know, th- th- there is a very strong sense in Serbia that we need a strong leader right. in in the public, and they perceive that Putin is a lo- strong leader. They 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 also kind of look up to the countries such as Hungary with Orban or or Turkey right. with Erdogan. And so, look at the history. You yeah, know, you go at Tito. Yeah, for exactly. yeah. Even though Tito wasn't yeah. a Serb. Yeah. But and then you had Milosevic after that. Right. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. Uh, you know that that is to say, Serbia is a very fertile ground for for that kind of influence. Secondly, um, 
I would, I would say in the U.S., the story about foreign influence is mainly around digital media and mainly around Facebook or Twitter or, or uh, networks like that. In Serbia, around uh, 90% of the public still get all of their news through TV, TV. And, mm -hmm. and newspapers. So ultimately, the, the influence can be exerted or is, is easily exerted by kind of having relationships with, uh, with newspapers, with journalists, uh, with TV journalists. And this is something that, that the, I would say, uh, Russian agencies or, mm -hmm. or Russian organizations have been nurturing for, mm -hmm. for years and for many years. And oligarchs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... But and they kind of are blended together. Yes, yes. <laughs> then another thing has happened in Serbia, and that is, you know, the, the, the companies have started, the, you know, the, the, the newspapers or, or the media have started relying more and more on companies advertising in yes. them. And the prices of news, it, it is the same everywhere. Yeah. And the, the newspaper prices are going down, the, the expense of media, the kind of the expense of media consumption for the average citizen is very low. Mm -hmm. And that makes the media rely on, on these uh, uh, sponsors, so to, so to say. Mm -hmm. Uh, unfortunately, in they Serbia, they have editorial control over them yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, and and unfortunately, in Serbia, journalists are are much less. You know, uh, average in Serbia is much lower than Europe or the U.S. And then the average journalist in Serbia is is below average in Serbia. So that means that that unfortunately, it is very easy to exert that that kind of influence. Exactly. This leads to my next question, sure. actually, which is that in this media environment. Um, how do you see that in affecting um, or even causing some of these misconceptions that we've that we've seen uh, in the guidebook? How does the how does the media in Serbia contribute? Connor, to that? what is the guidebook? Can you tell the listeners what that is? All right, so the guidebook is um, something that SIPE has been working um, alongside our partner in Serbia, uh, Libertarian Club Libek, to create. It is uh, ten mis common economic misconceptions in Serbia. It shows a lot of the challenges behind those um, and also provide some potential solutions uh, who, to solving those this? challenges. Uh, the economic misconceptions, the guidebook itself. Yes. Uh -huh. um, so you can access it both in uh, Serbian and in English online. So anyone in Serbia, anyone here in the U.S. even can, can read the guidebook. And what kind of influence has it had? Um, so far, we've seen a lot of influence in the media. Um, a lot of people have retweeted it. A lot of people have commented on it. Um, and that's that's mainly what we've seen so far. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk about the misconceptions mm. and and what's driving that and what are the misconceptions. Well, the the misconceptions are many, and and I think Libex uh, response to this is is very much um, uh, w with a very good forethought and 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 could be very strong. So the the idea is to address these misconceptions with a fact based uh, answers. Uh, the, the misconceptions are, well, predominantly the, the, the primary misconception is uh, uh, called, you know, uh, the, the state will do it. Mm -hmm. So there is an overwhelming... That hasn't changed since yeah. I was over there. <laughs> the, there. There is an overwhelming idea that whatever problem comes along, the state should do it. Uh, so whatever it is, it could be agriculture, it could be... Uh, manufacturing. Manufacturing. Yeah. It could be uh, uh, health care. It mm -hmm. could be education. So in particular, health care. Right. Yeah. So it, it goes from legitimate uh, uh, issues like health care, yep. maybe, and education. Yeah. But it goes down or to... infrastructure. The, or infrastructure, yeah. But it goes all the way to, you know, I have a problem with the supplier, let the state handle it. Right. I've been foolish enough to, uh, to take my mortgage uh, indexed in Swiss francs, yeah. let the state help me. So there is, a, there is an overwhelming uh, feeling that everybody should be bailed out. Uh, there is an overwhelming feeling that the state is better at controlling the economy than the market. And that myth is perpetuated by some of the foreign media that we we're talking about, the influence, especially from Russia, because right. that's, that's the narrative that they want people to believe. Right. The, the ideal narrative is, uh, look, we have a problem in the economy. Mm -hmm. And there is, a, uh, there is a YouTube video of Putin lining up his oligarchs and telling them you should do this this way. So th that, is the, that is the kind of, uh, I think, the perfect metaphor to understand how people think mm -hmm. our, our uh, leaders sh should address these issues. And there is this kind of uh, uh, the idea that persons are not 
necessarily responsible for their action, not necessarily responsible for how they act in the in the in the economy. And everybody uh, feels that solidarity is a concept that should stretch to things like you know market economy and right. and so on. So th- th- that is the primary misconception. And I think from that misconception. Uh, all others are kind of growing out. How do you change that perception? Because we talked a little bit about it a while ago. Serbs, if, if you look at the public opinion, uh, and you mentioned it a while ago, that they're looking for a strong leader, an autocratic leader, because that's really historically what, they're, what they've been used to. You go back to the Ottoman Empire, and then after that, we talked about Tito, we talked about Milosevic. So that's, how do you change that perception? How, how do you get the Serbian population to start looking at these other non-governmental factors to solve the problems? <clears throat> well, I think step by step. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's, it, it was easier uh, 50 years ago for an autocrat to rule a country. I think it's much much more difficult right now. I think there are new ways of communicating to uh, to young people in particular to explain to them what kind of misconceptions are associated with uh, with autocratic leadership, with a strong leader, and so on. So I think it's it's a it's a thing that will take some time to uh, to address, and it has to be done one step at a one time. One step at a time, right. And and unfortunately, it will, it will be a long process. It will be... Generational. Uh, yeah, it will be generational, of course. Yeah. So, But but it, it has to move. You know, th- there has to be engagement mm-hmm. by by organizations such as uh, uh, such as Libek or such as CERTA and, and others that, that understand that accountability, uh, that understand that fact-based approach to discussion and who understand that ultimately discussing major issues in a in a normal civil debate is something that moves uh, society forward rather than just big breaks with uh, with the previous regime with the previous regime because the, the Serbian history, unfortunately, is a is a history of, of overthrowing. It is not yeah, that's a right. history of continuity, and and until we break this cycle and enter this sort of cycles of continuity and start improving, you know, one generation at a time, or hopefully even half a generation at right. a time, I think it will improve. Right, and a big way to do that is through public education. And I know your organization, along with the help from from mine site. Mm-hmm is really doing that. We, we've uh, helped you guys uh, put together videos, uh, educational videos, uh, and that's been going on for a long time. I know you're involved in an organization called FEDIN, mm-hmm. uh, which is an organization that, that, through the NED, the National Endowment of Democracy, started, and you're a member. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how important that is? Well, it, it's, it's one of the things that I think creates bridges between Serbia and the Western right. world. Which is or, part of this education process right, you're talking about. Right, right. Because it, it's very... <laughs> people in Serbia, when you ask them who is the mo- what, what is the best country in the world, they will tell you Russia. Where do you want to live? The U.S. So, you know, th- th- this... <laughs> Why is, is that? Let's, let's break that down just a little bit. Um, well, I, I think it's because people are ultimately... Ultimately, understand uh, that there is a misconception in their, I don't know, left hemisphere, and there is <laughs> there is a, a, a right voice uh, in the right hemisphere. So I think thing, things like like that because there it's are just a, like a reaction. Yeah. Well, of course it's Russia. Yeah. But I want to live in the U.S. Right. Right. So. You know, uh, uh, we we uh, we just uh, so I just saw a, a research saying that you know uh, I think seventy five percent of people believe that that Russia is superior to NATO in terms of military, mm-hmm. and I was thinking, who asks this question? And who answers who this answers question? It, right? Who answers it? Who says yes or no to such a question? I would say no, I have no clue, honestly, because you know I, I can guess, I can look at GDP, I can look at stuff like, but I can just guess. But people know, so they have this kind of instinct reaction that Russia right. is uh, an awesome fairy tale land, but they want to send their children to the U.S. Right. And there is a there is a huge huge difference between these. Uh, parts of I think uh, uh, the Serbian public ultimately. So so, going back to your question, I want to make you know m- m- I want the uh, to make it possible for us to have as many bridges to the Western world to the U.S. as possible to make sure that people understand how you know this is a great country and and we should aspire to become 
uh, uh, such a country and we should see what free market does and we should see what democracy does and we should see what free society and open values do and so you know transpo transporting or, or or i don't know sending some importing some of that knowledge into into serbia is is uh, uh, very important well, well that brings me to my next question uh, about investment from western countries mm. and we talked about that that overwhelmingly uh, mm -hmm. The majority of the investment comes, especially from Western Europe. Yeah. How has that made a dent in that public perception? Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about technology. We're talking about manufacturing. Um, even little things like uh, McDonald's and, and, and Western music. Mm -hmm. Has that really made a dent since you grew up there? You were born there. Since you were a child, how has that really changed? It, I mean, are, are organizations like you really making a dent? Even though it's slow, is it happening? Uh, I think the, the key dent is being done in the cultural sphere. So, uh, you know, y y U.S. shows are the biggest shows. Music. U.S. films, mu yeah. music, and so on. Uh, uh, so, so that is making a dent. Investments, I, I, I don't see them really making a dent because we see a huge increase of the investments, but we don't see change in the public perceptions. Ah, yeah, right. So the, the, the correlation seems to be missing, and I think what's, what's needed now is more organizations, more individuals mm -hmm. being associated with more organizations so they more. don't see the connection there right. yet so right. and it's right. because of lack of job growth and things like mm -hmm. that they don't see the direct benefit of it in their personal lives well you know the the, the research that i would like to see mm -hmm. is the difference in opinions between people living in belgrade versus people living in the rest of Serbia. like in split or something yeah, like, yeah. because when when you see uh, when you see belgrade you feel as if you were in you know any vibrant European yeah, European city, city. Yeah. absolutely, yeah. and then when you move a hundred kilometers any direction or yeah. even twenty kilometers any direction, you feel the uh, you know the eastern yeah. far 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 eastern. Although the farther country. north and west mm. you go, it feels more European than it does. Well, yeah, fortunately, yeah. Vojvodina, the northern province right. of Serbia, was part of Austro-Hungarian Empire. That's right, and, up then, until, and then everything yeah. south yeah. was was part of the Ottoman right. Empire. Yeah, right. right. When when we see, for example, the literacy charts in just after the the First World War, that always fascinated yeah. me about Serbia. The, it, it's it's amazing when you see the, the border was on Sava and Danube. Uh, That's right. The, mm -hmm. the two rivers that 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 pass through Belgrade, um, and the northern part uh, was, I think, about. 50% or 60% literate, and then everything south right. was below 30%. Right. So it's amazing to see how and those And the Ottomans historic... were there for over 400 years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Almost <laughs> almost 500. Almost 500 yeah. years. Yeah. yeah. So so that that has made, obviously, historic differences between even parts, of, parts of Serbia. Vojvodina is very r rich because of its agriculture, because mm -hmm. of uh, its uh, Austrian heritage as well. Uh, uh, but, but then Belgrade is even more... Uh, uh, rich than that. I think yes. Belgrade is, in terms of GDP per capita, uh, around two times uh, right. the, the rest, rest of the country. Serbia. Yeah. So it's, uh, it, it, it's as if you were living in, in two different yeah, uh, places. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're toward the end of the show. There's a segment that I call five years from now. Okay. So if you were to come back and do this show five years mm -hmm. from now, what will we be talking about? Well, I, I hope, first of all, that, that, that it will, Serbia will still be stable. And and I think we we, we need to um, w we cannot underestimate the fact that for almost twenty years we haven't had a war. Mm -hmm. It's not a given in in the Balkans. Right. It's not a given in Serbia. Uh, and then we haven't had uh, a lot of kind of violent uh, political uh, problems since two thousand three, since Jinjic right. was assassinated. And things are moving into the direction where we, I think, will recognize Kosovo very, very soon. We'll have a uh, normal relationship with uh, with our neighbors, and hopefully, all of these uh, all of these misconceptions will be. I, I, hopefully, there will be fewer of them, and hopefully, they will be uh, less significant than they are now. And hopefully, there will be more U.S. or EU influence uh, uh, in 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 Serbia just on the on the account of more people um, exchanging ideas. Ideas and just interacting with with each other. So I just I hope that five years from now, if we're doing this podcast, I would be be saying, you know, 
boring stuff in a way. So it, it hasn't changed the, uh, a bit except that it's changed uh, to the better. Yeah, uh, incremental it, increases like you were talking about. Right. Yeah. I, well, wealthier people don't think about, uh, about Russian autocrats as much as uh, the poor people. Right. So the richer uh, Serbia becomes, I think, the less of a problem uh, Russian influence. Right. Connor, last word with you. What do you think? Um, I just want to thank Roscoe, first of all, for uh, agreeing to speak with us today. It's been very interesting. And uh, also, I'd just like to um, let the the listeners know that if you're interested in the misconceptions and reading more about those um, and kind of the background behind them, uh, we recently wrote a blog on this. So you can find a link to the guidebook on site. Uh, development blog. Yeah, just go to site.org and uh, you can go to the newsroom, look, look in the blogs, and you can find everything there. Ross, thanks so much for coming in. I hope you get a little bit of rest. I know you just got in. How long are you going to be in town? Um, up, up until Sunday, actually. Excellent. Yeah. Well, have a good trip. Hopefully, the weather will cooperate with you. It's I know it's cold this morning, but I think it's going to warm up toward That's the end nice. of the week. It's so. nice. I like it. Thanks so much, Connor. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see everybody next week. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to Democracy That Delivers. For more information about the Center for International Private Enterprise, please go to our website at cipe.org. That's C-I-P-E dot org. Thanks for listening.